If you happen to be a fan of high-order bandpass enclosures, you may have wondered if some of those vents could be replaced with passive radiators. Well, Snapmaker just sent me the J1S, and I have an idea for an interesting feature build. The machine is practically ready to go from the outset, and after some initial probing, we begin with a failed to load filament message. Better luck on the second attempt, this time with a bit of lifting. Nevertheless, this is the IDEX calibration print, followed by something vaguely akin to input shaping. Afterwards, a pre-sliced 3D benchy, and right away, things are looking a bit coarse. A slight improvement several millimeters up, though ultimately, the build plate adhesion isn't quite there. Here's a do-over with a slightly tighter gap. Unfortunately, it too failed, and so did every subsequent attempt, even after an impromptu recalibration. What's more, the benches that actually held on somehow managed to peel and shed, ultimately forming obstacles for the nozzle to crash into and dislodge the print just the same. So, on a hunch that maybe this is just some hellaciously sh** PLA, I ran the print in mirror mode to see if the other spool does any better. And, to my surprise, 23 minutes later, both prints finished. I don't necessarily know what to make of that, but the benchies do look decent, even if it took some trial and error to get there. Now I'll just clearly label the remainder of this filament as not intended for 3D printing under any circumstances. And in the spirit of disposal, I'm also going to make room for the J1S in my office, given that it kind of takes up the bench, and the Chidi Tech is also beginning to show its mileage. So, for my first actual print, I return to the 3D benchy, mostly as a sanity check. This is rapid PETG from Elegoo, some pretty reliable stuff, and with the model sliced for quality over speed, the results are a tad wispy, otherwise no issues with adhesion, or the filament clumping into obstacles for the nozzle. Next, I decided to test the lack of adhesion between materials like PLA and PETG. So, I modeled a PETG sphere, gave it some PLA supports, and yeah, that kinda works. Moving on. For today's feature build, I thought I'd showcase a few technologies pertaining to volumetric efficiency. And while there's only so much that I can do to convey that loud, chest-felt rumble over YouTube, I can certainly make it come out of an impossibly tiny box powered by an equally small amplifier, say, fewer than 10 watts. Here's the loadout for what I have in mind, and before you get a chance to ask, I have no affiliation with Dayton Audio. I simply like the fact that I can get all this cool shit for well under 100 bucks, starting with a pair of these 4-inch mid-bass drivers that I've already showcased in a number of other projects. The two of them will mount face-to-face, -face, forming an isobaric group, which will then be encased in an extremely compact 6th order series tuned bandpass arrangement, with a 6.5-inch passive radiator serving as the outer vent. This technique is generally reserved for near-field subwoofers intended to operate in a small space, very close to the listener. And given how small I've elected to make this one, I have also aligned it for an extension no lower than 45 Hz. Not the deepest trace I could muster, although at that size I also expected to play at volume on fewer than 5 watts. Throw in some protective features and here we have Motor, now available in printables for your close quarters amusement. Anyway, let's get to making, and this vent extension seems like an easy first step. As you can see here, it printed quite nicely without supports, and we'll get to test those as well with the very next print, as the handles will obviously have to form on top of something. Needless to say, the switchover between the materials is quite fast, and apart from some clumping, the results are pretty decent. The supports release without much ado, and the piece looks proper. So I'll just repeat that print, and now we have two. Up next is the internal baffle, looking a little rough along that rear corner, and before too awful long, we have lifting. So after some more re-leveling, here's a do-over, once again looking a bit gritty. It also bears mentioning that there's no adjustment knob for that specific corner. Nevertheless, the machine chugs along until we come to a layer shift. Hadn't encountered one of those in forever, but there it is. So I'll give it one last try, scrubbing the build plate with alcohol, and here we go. While I'm at it, let's see how the machine handles filament runout. So let me just snip the line. Sounded as though somebody snipped the wire. Really? 
What did it sound like? Snip. In response to which, the touchscreen issues its one all-purpose warning, giving a chance to swap the filament and, as such, the print eventually completes, thankfully without any lifting. This just leaves the two half shells looking pretty rough for starters, however, after another recalibration, we appear to have a smooth first layer, compromised only by the wispy clumps. All in all, things appeared quite promising, until the entire back of the print curled up, causing the extruder to jam. So, once more from the top just to establish consistency and… yeah, that's pretty consistent. In fact, now I'm a little weary of any J1S review that doesn't show what happens when you cover this much of the build plate, especially if there's no intuitive workaround to the models not sticking. Nevertheless, with the two half shells completed on a different machine, the threaded inserts are sunk into the baffle some reusable adhesive for a proper air seal, and there is the first driver perfectly aligned on the bolt pattern, which speaks to Snapmaker's dimensional accuracy. There's the other one, as some of you will already have seen on X, and as we wire the push-pull ISO group, it's important to remember that the rear driver is wired in phase, while the front driver is wired out of phase. With that intact, Sophie gets to JB welding the inner ledge so that I can plop the baffle in there and give it a good squeeze over the next 24 hours. After that, another dollop of epoxy, and the short end of the port goes in there like so. That just leaves the tongue and groove joint between the two half shells, and once properly slathered, we seal the deal. The following day, the business end of the enclosure is due for some threaded inserts as well. The passive radiator should operate without any added mass, that's how I modeled it anyway, and will want plenty of reusable adhesive around the landing. So, with the final hatch buttoned down tight, it's time to think of some goofy way to power this thing. And in one of my parts bins, I found this long since discontinued class D amplifier board, which seems perfect as I can easily monitor the electrical load. So, I measured it, designed a little case, and then it's right back onto the Snapmaker. To its credit, the machine completed both prints on the first try, and it didn't do a half bad job, although I'm less than impressed with these lines formed by the slow travel moves. Nevertheless, with everything wired up and bolted down, the little case becomes the world's most minimalistic amplifier. Check it out. The volts go in here, 12 of them just for starters, and with this bench top supply we can monitor the power draw. The input signal goes from the DSP into here, and then the output signal comes out of here into a speaker. So, with that patched into motor and the DSP cleared out, the near-field response is absolutely dead on with the prediction. This is where a 45Hz high-pass filter keeps the drivers from unloading, and an 80Hz low-pass filter keeps the output mostly non-directional. That just leaves the protective grills, and while the finished product came out to spec, I feel like there's entirely too much of it that I didn't print on the Snapmaker. So, given that I've had better luck with smaller prints, how about this? When I first introduced the Wallop, I kept getting asked about the companion pods. Well, tough luck, as Fountech doesn't even make these anymore. Dayton, however, makes the PS95, and if we drop it into a 1.43 liter sealed volume, we should expect something kind of like this. I've even kept the design vaguely similar. So, there's that happening on the J1S, once again with PLA supports, and 20 some odd hours later, the print completes without incident. This is followed by some tricky support removal, but in the end, the results are decent. So, here's the other pod, once again completing successfully on the first go, which just leaves the wires, some polyfill to help absorb the internal resonances, and with the leads soldered in, the drivers mount with a set of M4 screws threading directly into the print. The RTA more or less confirms why I won't be using these much below 100Hz, so that's literally just a high-pass filter and that is the setup. For a near-field demo, I had Sophie downfire this up directly by her feet after it was established that it is cute, and that's the passive radiator. Oh, that's cute! And that's the passive radiator, right?
on printables for anyone interested in isobaric loading, although with a 45Hz mechanical limit, I wouldn't necessarily rely on this as your go-to subwoofer. It's more of an exercise in space and power efficiency. That being said, you can also check out one of my earlier videos for a deep dive on the math behind grouping drivers isobarically. All that aside, the Snapmaker J1S is a reasonable dual extruder solution within a certain build volume. Obviously, not quite the 240 by 190 millimeters needed to print motor, but certainly with smaller prints. Just recently, Sophie wanted a few more of these giant thumbtacks that I originally designed for storing headphones. Meanwhile, they turned out to be handy, just in general, so this is one of those things that your old stash of PLA could be made into. And here's the Snapmaker doing a very nice job. I even gave it some additional time to exhibit lifting with the unnecessarily dense infill. Nevertheless, it would appear that anything roughly that size is likely to complete without any adhesion-related issues, which may be enough depending on the kinds of things you make. I'm also quite happy with the speed at which the extruders change over mid-print. This is in contrast to any single extruder machine and the inevitable purge cycles between the materials. All in all, I mostly like this 3D printer and many thanks to Snapmaker for sending it over. If you enjoyed the demo, drop a comment with your listening gear, which I will read when you least expect it. Don't forget to rate the video as you see fit, subscribe if you're so inclined, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!